housing, and you might like to do them in the, those two sort of sides, please. Um, just to, in answer to the question about is there one country we can look at, unfortunately not, but there are <laughs> models of good practice that we can learn from, because obviously we're in a situation where we do have direct provision and emergency reception orientations, and so we have to move, if the will is there, uh, to, to a different model from where we're at. But the, the document that we've referred to from 2013, which you'll be able to click onto on the electronic version of our uh, recommendations of our report, um, will takes from different countries and suggests, for example, when you're looking at vulnerability for victims of torture or people that have special medical needs, what could be part of the system? for people who are um, coming from certain countries. So there are different models there. But for example, just to, just to refer to Germany, which of course has taken a million in, in last year, one of the things they did um, was employ 8,000 German language teachers because they recognized that language was key to integration. Uh, and, and, and this comes with links with the point that you've made, Deputy Harty, about integration in the emergency reception orientation centres. Yes, it's part of it. And, for example, in Monas Revin, the Department of Justice have, have, have contracted the uh, Kildare Volunteer Association to assist with that integration. But it can add another level of a barrier when others want to be involved. If it's being, at its crudest, policed in that way. But, yes, it does exist, but not for the direct provision centres. Um, but but that's, that's what hasn't been provided, for example, is the language support that was needed in Monastery Revan and other places. So it compares, you know, if you're going to do this properly, of course it is an issue of resources. I know that people involved in education in Monastery Revan met early on when that centre was going to be opened for resettled refugees and said, look, well, what, can we have any extra support for children that don't speak English? Can we have extra language so that we can engage with the parents? And I think an interpreter was going down once a week, and that's not sufficient to, to enable that. But in answer to the question, are they homeless? Um, classed as homeless when they're in direct provision? No, they're not. Um, yes, they could be homeless if they've left afterwards, and we do know of people who are queuing up as homeless. But one of the big problems around direct provision is that there is no statutory framework for it whatsoever. We've just passed the first piece of major legislation on refugees, the International Protection Act 2015. In almost 20 years, there is no reference to the reception and accommodation and support of asylum seekers and refugees. It doesn't exist. So we're still working on an administrative basis, which in one level means you can make changes a little bit easier, but it also means, for example, lack of oversight from, from, from elected representatives to the same extent that you might get if it was in statute. So they fall outside uh, of everything. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm conscious I'm answering all of the questions, so Rory, just butt in. <laughs> um, looking at homes, it's, it's the transition out of direct provision is, is where people need, need the help. Um, and if they got the help with integration while they were in direct provision, that would make that transition a lot easier. As you said, when they know of the systems and structures that they have to negotiate once they get out. Um, but yeah, that's uh, the big issue is integration while they're in the direct provision system. It would make life easier. In terms of the, the answer about um, advocacy by existing organisations, I would actually have a mixed model of, of, of particularly local authority with NGOs that specialise. And, and there's some good experiences now being built up as a result of refugees being resettled in greater numbers um, um, within Ireland in places such as Thurlis and Tipperary. Uh, it's Thur Thurlis and uh, Port Leash. So there are examples of inter-agency approaches which involves the voluntary sector, involves local authority and an element of central authority as well. And I think that there, there, if that could be brought out, that can work well. Because you don't want to reinvent the wheel where people are already good, citizens' information, if they're already used to dealing with a variety of different issues, bring them together. But don't miss out the voluntary sector. It wouldn't involve an organisation like us because we're national rather than local. But, you know, we work with groups like the National Learning Network, which have got 50 centres around the country and could be involved in helping people gain access to employment. And we've worked on a pilot with them. So interagency, I would say, is very much the approach that I would take. I, I think that's addressed the questions around housing. Yes. So if I, I'll come to Deputy Wallace's... You um, can conclude with Deputy Wallace, yes. <laughs> I'll deal with Deputy Wallace. Um, and I'm very much aware that you've been yourself to Calais and the impact that that had. 
Um, one of the great things about Ireland and Irish people is the way in which they don't wait, they go. And the number of people that have been out, uh, Irish refugee, Dublin to Calais refugee solidarity group and others have been out in order to provide direct assistance to people who were there. And for the record, I've also done work with haulage companies and lorry drivers on the grounds that they've picked up fines for bringing people in inadvertently when they never intended to. And we, I've done it on the grounds that don't penalise somebody for doing their job when they're not a people smuggler or a trafficker. They just can't police their vehicle the whole of the time. So there's various little bit of work have been done. Um, one of the groups that's been out to Calais, Dunkirk, and also to Cherbourg, because it's Cherbourg through to Ireland more directly, is the Immigrant Council of Ireland, who followed a UK lawyer's model of seeing whether or not there were people attempting to come to Ireland who had family members there. I, most of the people they came across were people wanting to go to the UK. But um, I have no doubt that if any do identify themselves as wanting to join family, that um, an attempt will be made to persuade the Irish government to allow them to come without waiting for their asylum claim 18 months later to be dealt with in France. And that includes unaccompanied children, and unfortunately France really falls down when it comes to unaccompanied children. And that's why there's such a number in those camps in Calais, because they just don't address them as a specific group, despite the need for them. So I think there are people looking at how to do that. Um, uh, but then there are people in Greece that are actually indicating they would be willing to come to Ireland. And so I think the department could actually say, let's be a bit more proactive. Portugal put it out there that they would take people. They actually produced a video to say, come to Portugal, because Portugal has lost so many Portuguese. They know they need people for the labour market to rebuild the country. Uh, there are things like that that could be done, even in countries such as Greece, to say, look, we're open. We haven't, we're not anywhere near the commitment we've made of 2,900, so let's be a bit more proactive in Greece and actually determine who could come and avoid the necessity to end up in camps like Calais. And then in terms of the Kurds and the Afghans, a huge question. I'm sure you don't expect me to answer it in full, but the big concern about the EU-Turkey deal is that, again, Syrians were prioritised and Afghanistan, so Turkey has no commitment to not return Afghans uh, and Iraqis even to those countries. Um, and we know already that they're even preventing Syrians from crossing as well. Uh, children included have been shot dead at the border with Turkey and many have been beaten by Turkish border guards. I think that's part of a much wider debate as to the whole issue of uh, refugee and forced migration at the moment because what we've got to avoid, and that's why I, I commented on it at the very outset, is a two-tier system where we say deserving refugees and undeserving refugees or refugees and economic migrants because these are all on a continuum at some point in time. So I think that's much part of a bigger refugee question but Ireland is co-hosting a 196 state UN conference in September in New York on the whole crisis and that goes beyond the remit of this committee but that's where the Doyle and the Shennett can actually be saying what do we want to see okay it's a hosting role so it's a bit like being a chair and you're remaining neutral but it's a great opportunity for Ireland to actually say what are we doing as a country that we could be someone else can hold us up as a model or what can we be working towards so that conference in September is key I think to both the questions and the issues we've discussed here but also those much bigger issues that we don't differentiate because of, because what we're seeing is people claiming to be Syrian who aren't Syrian because they know that Syrians are getting preferential treatment that does them no good and it does the Syrians a disservice as well but it's bound to happen because if you can get through the gate, if you're Syrian, you're going to try and do that in order to save yourself and save your family or be reunited. So that doesn't, I can't do justice to that question because it's much bigger, but be happy to touch base with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. That concludes this section. Ms. Gonlan, Mr. O'Neill, thank you very much for your attendance and your submission. And also, just to remind you, if in terms of the housing element, in particular the housing and homelessness, if there's any recommendations you feel that would be of use to the committee, the time is short, so I'd ask you to forward them to us as a matter of urgency. As I say, we will be concluding our work over the next couple of weeks, and it's that aspect in particular. Thank you very much for your attendance you. today. Uh, we'll go to private session as the next group comes in, please. Thank you.
Um, and the, the first thing is to remind both the witnesses and colleagues, the mobile phones, would you put them on flight mode or turn them off, please? And secondly, the note in relation to privilege. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence to the, their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. The opening statement that you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I'd like to welcome uh, Pave Point, who are represented today by uh, Ronnie Fay. Uh, Mary Bridget McCann, Ms E. Collins and Eamon McCann, you're all very welcome and thank you for your attendance. Uh, we have received your opening submission and it has been circulated to colleagues. So I'd now like to invite you to address the meeting and then colleagues will have a number of questions okay. for you, I'm sure. Okay, Chairman and members of the committee, Pavy Point is delighted. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Thank sorry, you. sorry about that. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, Pavi Point is delighted to have the opportunity to make a presentation to the committee and we welcome the fact that the accommodation needs of travellers in Roma are included in the overall discussions on the housing crisis. Today we focus explicitly on traveller accommodation, however we would encourage the committee to examine the housing needs of the Roma community at a later stage in your deliberations. Travellers experience marginalisation, discrimination and racism on the basis of their ethnicity at individual and institutional levels. Local authorities have continuously failed to provide permanent, safe and adequate traveller specific accommodation which they are responsible for. Paradoxically, local authorities use health and safety issues as a basis for ongoing traveller evictions. Subsequent to the tragic fire on a traveller site in Carrick Mines in 2015, a national fire safety audit in traveller accommodation was rolled out. Even though we received an assurance that the audits would not result in forced evictions, a number of evictions have taken place throughout the country, leaving families homeless or forcing people to stay at homes and bays of extended family members. The lack of prioritisation and political will are illustrated in the cuts to the traveller accommodation budget. Between 2008 and 2013, the traveller accommodation budget was cut from 40 million to 4 million, a staggering 90%. Even more shockingly, there was actually an underspend of 36% of the allocated traveller accommodation budgets by local authorities. The government statistics, statistics obscure the reality of homelessness and accommodation conditions within the traveller community. The term sharing of houses and halting bays, is, 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 halting bay sites is a euphemism for travellers living in chronic overcrowding. The term basic service bays refers to sites that are often flooded, rat infested and lack sufficient facilities. The term unauthorised site refers to travellers who are forced to live at the roadside due to the lack of access to private rented accommodation, social housing and our traveller specific accommodation. These travellers are in effect homeless, but they are excluded from government statistics on homelessness. This is wholly unacceptable. Travellers who are homeless need to be categorised accordingly and their housing and accommodation needs must be met in a timely manner. According to the National Traveller Accommodation Consultative Committee Annual Report in 2013, 361 traveller families lived on unauthorised sites, 188 traveller families lived on basic service bays, 182 families shared permanent halting sites and 17 families shared basic service bays or transient halting sites. 600, 663 traveller families shared houses. This means that roughly 5,500 or 18.6% of the traveller population are in need of proper accommodation provision. 
And if you use the census 2011 figures, this would be the equivalent of 853, 415 of the general population in need of housing. Yet the traveller accommodation situation hasn't been regarded as a housing crisis. Recently, there's been a significant decrease of traveller families living in private rented accommodation. Between 2013 and 2015, 237 traveller families left private rented accommodation. This figure correlates with an increase of 200 traveller families sharing houses and an increase of 173 families on unauthorised sites. It is clear that traveller families are responding to the accommodation crisis by relocating to sites that are already overcrowded, unsafe and, un and inhabitable. In order to address these issues, we recommend the following. 1. The establishment of statutory traveller agencies with powers to approve and enforce local authority five-year accommodation plans. 2. Introduction of a monitoring and evaluation framework with associated sanctions, ensuring full expenditure of funds allocated to local authorities for traveller-specific accommodation. Three, increased provision and appropriate resourcing of accessible, suitable and culturally appropriate accommodation for travellers in Roma. Four, a reinstatement of the traveller accommodation budget to 2008 levels at a minimum of 40 million. Five, a moratorium on evictions and on the use of the Housing Miscellaneous Provisions Act until the accommodation needs of all travellers on the housing list have been met. And six, abandon the use of the terms sharing, basic services and unauthorised sites in order to provide an accurate reflection of the housing and accommodation crisis and include travellers in government statistics on homelessness. We thank you for your attention and the opportunity to discuss these matters further. Thank you very much uh, for your opening statement. Um, I'm going to take a number of questions and you can decide amongst you what way you want to answer them. But one is from myself, just very, very directly. The figures you quoted were based on your report of 2013. Um, and I suppose from the committee's point of view, that's a number of years ago. You might give us an overview of where you think things stand today, and I suppose you don't have the, the exact figures, but the trend, because you did make the point that that represented 5,500 people, 18% of that. So just where you think it is today. Deputy O'Dowd, please. Um, I'd like to welcome our speakers here today. I put on a parliamentary question. If it's helpful, I got it answered yesterday in relation to funding for travel. I'll just read it from this, if I may. It, it says that the, that the allocation for 2016 is 5.5 million, which is an increase of 1.2 million on the 2015 allocation, which obviously is, is a positive uh, point. But what comes up in the PQ, I ask for each county uh, from 2013, each local authority, so the figures are up to date, is that there are a significant number of counties that seem to have applied for nothing. Uh, and that concerns me because I presume that if we have a national plan uh, for, 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 for assisting uh, in traveller accommodation, that counties would have to have their own plan and would have to obviously have a demand on the, on the exchequer each year. Now, if that's not happening, that's a serious matter to me if there are travellers within, within that community. Sorry. Uh, you can understand why I have my phone with me, uh, but that's not, that's not the call. <laughs> that's not the call. Uh, but uh, I don't see you all laughing. <laughs> There's no laugh, I can tell you. Um, but it, it appears that counties are not actually applying. So I think we need to get the facts, and I suppose it's more for not this committee, but I think the committee should insist that every county, if they, if they have a plan, that it should be, you know, we, we should have, a, we, we should, somebody should have oversight of it, not perhaps this committee in terms of the shortness of time, but it is not acceptable that traveller accommodation needs are not being met at all in some counties, and, and that, is, that is an obligation, a statutory obliga obligation on them. The other issue you raised, because I live in County Law, I'm a member of the, I've never been a member of the I have been a member of the council in the past, but I'm not now. And when the county council, as they did in County Loud, went to evict travellers from an illegal site, we had no notice of that, no prior notice of it, no opportunity to intervene and to make the point that you make, which I fully support, that there should be no evictions unless and until there's a proper acceptable place for people to go to. And I think that is the key.
But there is one proviso I would make, and it, in Dundalk, the local authority had to spend something like 100,000 in the removal of uh, waste and things from the site, and that's a huge cost on the local authority, and I have to acknowledge that that's an issue that, that it shouldn't have to deal with. So I think there's an issue there, but I'm not lecturing and I'm not preaching. I support what you're saying, and I, I, but I, I do think that there should be no evictions unless we have a better place to put them in. I think that's absolutely critical. And that would create, I think, a security, even of a, of a tenure place that's not up to standard. Obviously, they aren't. But that we shouldn't move them until we have somewhere decent for them to go. And I think that's a fundamental human rights issue that, that we have to address. And I also think that the no local authority uh, should move against uh, travellers without notifying all elected representatives in that area in advance so we could have an opportunity uh, to bring things to the notice of the authority or to make representations or to, to you know, to, because these are, they are human beings, there are, there are children involved and in they have basic human rights. Um, that's, that's thank right. you, Deputy. Deputy O'Sullivan, and then I'll come, come back to you. Deputy O'Sullivan. <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you for that, Ronnie. Um, first question it follows off from what the Chairman said. Do you have figures on the, require, uh, the needs and the wishes of the traveller community in need of, accommod of accommodation, as in terms of are they looking at living on sites or in houses, uh, so that we know exactly what the figures are for each section of, of accommodation. You mentioned the statutory traveller agency. Um, just could you elaborate on that and who you would see as sitting on that? And the third question would be about the underspend. Were there reasons given for the underspend at all to you? Um, when there was a decrease in private rent, was that because of rents going up or were there other reasons on that one? Um, and we know that the other issue is that <clears throat> Um, which is awful, the public perception of travellers, and when there is a situation of somebody getting accommodation, whether it's a site or whatever, the views of certain people in our society. And what, can, what sort of recommendations, what can we do? It's a massive problem, I know, but to address that. And, you know, I think back to the last time up in Pavy Point, the great celebration, President Michael D. Higgins was there, and the huge, you know, the culture, everything about traveller, that, that's not getting out to the general population and what we can do to address that. Thanks, Thank Ronnie. you. Thank you, Deputy. Do any of you want to answer something first and then I think? Yeah, well, I suppose living and working in an area that I have huge contact with the travelling community also. I'm a traveller myself and we visit a lot of travel families in the area and accommodation has always been an issue for travellers. Even in 2008, before the recession came in, accommodation was always a problem within the travelling community and people were coming looking for the bus for help. We didn't have the power to repair or do anything for them. All we could do was to report for them. Um, given that the budgets for the last number of years, all the cuts through the budgets, rent allowance for under 25s, given the travellers marry much younger. That's not to say that the settled population doesn't go out and live and start families. It has a huge impact on travellers. Um, overcrowding, where I live myself, just Ronnie outlined there, travellers moving into private rent and not being able to afford the rent, landlords putting up the rent, the isolation with travellers in it, discrimination that they face, the travellers being bullied in the area and not being able to play with children in the area has all a huge impact on travellers' mental health as well. Um, as I says, the rent allowance being cut, everything like that, are huge problems around accommodation um, out there. Also, the underspent in lo for some local authorities, and um, like when Ireland was awash with money in 2008, I would always say travellers would have been one of the groups who actually didn't have didn't benefit for the Celtic Tiger and we were the ones for the last number of budgets with all the cuts that's been imposed on us and we were the people who have made suffer along with a lot of other people out there as well. Um, the issue that we face, as I said, in my area we have 50 houses but we have about 60 families and Ronnie just outlined there that people going into private rented, leaving private rented, as I said, not being able to afford and overcrowding is a problem with us in our area. Um, playgrounds in our area is a huge problem as well. We don't have any playgrounds and stuff like that. Um, as I said, the budget cuts usually there as well. Um, 
the rent allowance as well. So there's huge problems, um, lack of travel, specific accommodation, getting built. We're working with a family at the minute, and um, they were looking for a group housing scheme for their own family, and hasn't met the needs of the travellers. Now they're being kind of let into a housing estate, and they're being phased in, and there's four or five doors let in between each family. Now I don't think that's very fair to the family if they want to live as an extended family. I think their culture has to be respected as well, and also the travellers as well. So we have huge problems out here in our area as well. We have um, a, a temporary site, and the temporary site is well over 25 years there. So we done a mapping exercise there a couple of weeks ago around the Carrick Mines incident there, and uh, there was a, um, overcrowding is a problem. Um, electric wires just running everywhere, taking over, overloading of sockets and spell and uh, people are coming to us looking for support but we are limited what we actually can do now look we have a lot of government departments and every single one of them has responsibility to people in ireland but also to the traveling community and when i look at a travel accommodation my own experience just it hasn't been met the other thing that we face in our area as well is when young married couples come out of private rented and they move into a caravan and they move into the back of some of our houses they've been charged 20 euro rent because it's based on your income even though it's a separate family separate income separate home the income is assessed and we're charged 20 euro even though the young married couple mightn't have any facilities no water no electric and it's just i had a meeting with somebody today and they were saying look at as a tenant we're giving them the right to reside in our property so the divorce to supply them with water and electric so the young generation feel very disappointed that they've been charged something but not getting anything for it so just you just leave it doesn't matter <coughs> also on the ground as well that when we go out visiting families as well and we're promoting health we're promoting health on grounds when we go out there that travellers are living in such a bad condition some of them haven't got running water some of them haven't got a shower to wash in that and by going into private accommodation in particular I know families that I visit and there's one of them a mother of three children She's living in an apartment, isolated away from all her own extended family. She's living in a little, like a box room. And she has one bedroom with three children, herself and her husband. And she's crying out, she's crying out every time we go to her. More bodies than myself knows this. She's crying out for the house, to get a house, so that she can only have a little bit of a garden for to play in. If there was a, a, a site, a group housing, she, it'd be hands down, it'd be a welcome guest. But we know exactly what, a, and who'd know that better than myself? Because I went through that experience myself 24 years ago when I, when, when I came to live in an area and there was only piggies there. And I campaigned for the houses that we're in now, the same number of houses as Mary's after talking about. And unless the accommodation improves for travellers, and everybody has to take this into consideration, unless it does. We're going to have more suicide, we're going to have more mummies breaking down with mental health, because I can prove that, and I know that. So, in a way, they're crying out for help. OK, just maybe to refer back, um, the National Traveller Accommodation Consultative Committee is, par is set up under the auspice of the Department of the Environment, and as you know, they published their annual count and in fact the 2015 one is available online which is where I've pulled some of the most recent statistics from. The last published one I had was 2013 which is why I used the, that report but what, I, what, I, what the data is showing is, well there's a few issues one, that the data is presented in such a way it makes the analysis and the reality, it hides it and what we're saying is it needs to be much clearer so that people realise what's behind the, the, the data. Uh, secondly, one of the things we're looking for is an ethnic identifier, say, on HAP, on all of the, the pass, on all of those uh, information administrative systems, so we can actually see 
where travellers, Roma and other minority ethnic groups are to see are they overrepresented in particular sectors or you know, areas of provision. And we need that data. So that just in terms of the overall data, it is quite problematic in terms of how it's presented. I have given a background paper, a uh, much more detailed one, I don't know if you've sight of it, because one of the things you need to recognise is the demographics of the traveller community. They're significantly different to the general population. 42% of travellers are under 15 years of age. There's only 3% over 65. So it's a huge youth population. And if we don't make provision and plan for the communities that are there, we're just hostage to fortune in the future. And then we're going to be paying, you know, it's bad use of resources. Um, equally, the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study would have found the composition of traveller households, like 27% of traveller women have had five or more children compared to 2.6% of the general population. So it's ironic that the families with the youngest population, the greatest number of children, are living in the, most, the smallest number of space with the least facilities. And that's what we're actually seeing. So that has a huge impact in terms of travellers' quality of life, their life expectancy is clear in, the, in their health, um, you know, in their mortality rates and morbidity rates. So that context needs to be taken to, into account. In terms of funding, um, we noticed I was in Geneva last week at the Universal Periodic Review, the hearing on Ireland, and again in the state report it said, oh, we've had an increase of, what's an increase from 4 million to 5.4 million, and it, or 5.5 million. It looks great. What they didn't say, there was a decrease from 40 million a 90% decrease between 2008 and 2013. And I suppose what I would say is, in our experience, funding was never really the problem, even though it could be a problem now because of the impact of austerity. But traditionally, the budgets were never spent, 36% on spent. And we would believe that's to do with political will, it's uh, local prejudice and racism, objections by local residents, and it's the lack of sanctions by... Sorry, sorry. Are you telling me that of, of the four million allocated, 36? No. No. no between Just 2008 and 2013, there was an underspend of 36 percent over, yeah, over yeah, the period. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we would say is, and what we, why we call for an agency is, look, either local authorities are unwilling or unable to make the provision, and the Department of Environment oversees that, and nothing happens. And we're saying something has to happen. And we think, if you look what happened in Northern Ireland at the time, there was a lot of discrimination against Catholics and, and, in terms of Protestants and Catholic in housing. They set up the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. They took it out of the hands of the local authorities and they looked after the needs of the marginalised Catholics at that time. And we're saying, we believe a similar initiative is needed at this point in time. Um, and we, don't, we know it won't be the panacea for everything. And the other thing just to say is, we're not... Pavy Point isn't calling specifically for a traveller accommodation agency because equally we had the All-Ireland Health Study published in 2010. Mm -hmm. There's no action plan or a new revised traveller health strategy. So the group in Ireland with the worst health inequalities, there's no strategy in place. Mm -hmm. In terms of education, the cuts were minus 86%. So the accommodation needs to be seen in the context of the broader cuts to the whole traveller sector under the guise of austerity. And um, we would say, you know, lots of political choices were made because travellers aren't visible in the Oireachtas. You know, there, there are issues, you know, there isn't a traveller TD, there's never been one. Uh, we have good champions and some of you are in the room. But at the same time, it, you need, we, and we've called on the Taoiseach to consider appointing a traveller representative to the incoming um, Oireachtas. Because we just think, it's only when you start meeting people and hearing the reality that's sometimes when things change. Um, so um, the you you probably all heard this week the European Social Charter found against Ireland, which was an, an incredible. We were delighted, but what we would say it's a waste of our time and the state's time fighting battles externally. We're saying let's work together and solve these issues. If you think there's 36,000 travellers in the whole of the Republic of Ireland, they would all fit in the Hogan stand. Mm -hmm. And yet it's seen as a major political issue. And that's to do, with, a lot of it is to do with the traveller status. And, and you were asking what could change in terms of public perception. 
The government could acknowledge travellers as a minority ethnic group. Mm. That would send a clear signal that this is a community that's uh, indigenous to Ireland, that needs to be respected, that has their own culture, their own way of life, and should be recognised and respected for what it is. And I think that alone would just change the mindset, because what we see is the assimilationist mindset is still there. So local authority staff think we're going to put them in houses, we're going to force them into the houses. And that, that links to the question you asked around you know, the, the traveller-specific um, accommodation. There's an argument in terms of local authorities will say, oh, the majority of travellers are looking for standard housing. If you're told it'll take you 20 years to get a group housing scheme, it'll take you 40 years to get a transit site, but we have a house what box are you going to tick? Mm. If you're a mother with seven children. So, but the reality is people find it very hard to survive often in those conditions. Mm. And likewise, there was, and, and you know this better than me because you, you're on this committee and you've been doing a lot of work. You know, the, the public policy in terms of social housing was push people into private rented. So the, the figures grew from something like 2% in up to 30% of travellers were in private rented up to 2013 huge change. The problem was, as Mary Bridget has outlined, it, often it wasn't by choice. Mm. There was huge issues in accessing private rented in the first place. Most landlords did not want travellers. Mm. They, as you know, they didn't even want rent supplements, so the majority of travellers would, so it was like a double whammy. Mm. Um, and then the Roma are in entirely, they're, they're being totally abused, you know, because they, they're they visible often. You know, people know the Roma and they're having a, a really hard time. You have, you know, three, four, five families living in very small spaces. It, it's appalling what's happening there, and, and we would encourage you to look at that in more depth. Um, so in terms of private rented, A, accessing it was really difficult. B, surviving in it was even more difficult, because often travellers would have had to pay, bribe the landlord to give you the house yeah. by paying over the odds, and then up, topping up the, the monthly rent. So people who were dependent on social protection were actually then having it hard to survive because they were giving so much. So young travellers getting into huge debt because of trying to meet bills, huge stress then, the mental health issues. We have in situations, and Missy talked about it, young traveller mothers who, in traveller culture, yeah. your aunt, your sisters, your cousins, your nieces would all actually support you when you have a baby. Yeah. They're not used to being left out there on their own, behind gates often, you know, because yeah. some of them are in high-rise apartments. So the experience, and then often hiding their identity because they're afraid if the landlord finds out they're travellers, they're going to get evicted. Telling the kids they can't play with their cousins, telling their extended family, don't come to visit us, we'll come to visit you because they don't want their identity disclosed. There's massive issues in private rented. And what we're seeing now in those stats that I managed to get yesterday on the website is, you know, the, the, the 200 and whatever number of families I said have left private rented. But what they're doing is just going back to their families, doubling up, mm -hmm. living in, in very basic conditions. So, look, something has to give, do you know? And just to say, the, the National Traveller Accommodation Consultative Committee had commissioned a report on, and one of the recommendations in 2014 was to clarify and agree the demand for traveller specific accommodation. And what they asked the NTACC to do was to develop an agreed annual count and national assessment of need for the development of local traveller accommodation programmes. Because it's always contentious between what the local authorities are saying is in their area and what the travellers know are actually there. So we need accurate data, and that's back to the, the data that you're saying. Okay. Thank you. I, I would say again, that's who I am. <clears throat> and I have to say this. Why are we such a problem? It's not as we've dropped in for this last few years back. We've been around for centuries. And we have our own ways. We have our own culture. We have all very strong. And to bring children up in, a, in, 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 li in living conditions where the mommy and daddy is not even happy with them, that is... I think that's outstanding. It's stress on the mummy and daddy. It's stress on the, ch on the children. And maybe just to get back to say as well about the all Ireland Health Study. We campaigned for that all Ireland Health Study, first of all for a strategy, which took us at least nine years, a health strategy. And seeing the state of, of travellers' health, it shouldn't have took us nine years. Didn't it? In 2005, it was launched. Right? Didn't we campaign for the all Ireland Health Study? It took us another eight years. And that was, that was a tremendous piece of work that we carried out. And it was done from one end of Ireland to the other. 
we found out all the answers. And when I held that up over my head on the day when that was launching, and Minister Mary Harry was there, and plenty of more people with her, I was the proudest woman in Ireland, I thought, because as right now there's something going to be done with our, about our health and about our living conditions, about our, our education and that. How long ago was that? Has there been any movement in it? No. We've been waiting to death's doing, and our people is dying younger, suicide is seven times higher for men, and that. And how long more will we have to wait for a bit of civilisation in, in our own country? I suppose, as Ronnie said, we have a very young population that came out of the All Ireland Health Study. And I think it's time to give back to the travelling community because we are very disappointed that no actions have been taken and the study, given that it costs £1.4 million and has been sitting in the Department of Health ever since. Um, one of the things that came out of the study as well was the support and the family networks that we have living within a group housing scheme or with our extended family that we certainly wouldn't have if we lived in our standard housing. And out of the All-Ireland Health Study, we only got eight travellers over the age of 85 years of age. So we don't act now and government departments don't act now and give the younger generation a better quality of life, education, accommodation, less discrimination, better job opportunities, taking them in in jobs, giving them better jobs. As I said, they won't live as long as the general population because we do see the government coming out planning for the general population that is living longer into their 80s and 90s. But when you look at travellers, they're only living to 60 and 64. So I think you need to act now. We're, we're a lot of travel groups out there, a lot of traveller organisations. We've been talking for a long, long time. Went to a lot of committees, bring up a lot of issues, and there has been some progress, but there needs to be more around if travellers need to live that much longer than the general population. Thank you. I have a number of other deputies who have questions and comments for you. Deputy Function. I'll take a few of them together and then I'll come back to you. Deputy Function. Um, thanks, Chair. Just to say thanks very much for coming in and for the presentation and also for speaking with such honesty. I think that's, that's really important. Um, I, it's kind of been answered, but just to clarify, the statutory travel, traveller agency, would you see that body, if it was um, set up, as dealing with the, the issues of underspend and the fact that some local authorities are not drawing down money at all? And would you see that as having, obviously, a wider role than just housing? Because we have an issue where, for the last number of budgets at a local level, Carlo Kenny is the area I represent, where we've had money put aside for a traveller horse project, but yet we still haven't got it up and running. It's like we're going into our third year now, and we've increased the funding every year in the budget, but yet we still haven't done anything about it. And the other thing is just maybe to comment on your experience of that health and safety audit that was carried out, because I was in um, our halt, the halting site and in a number of caravans that I couldn't believe had had a health and safety audit and that it would pass, because there's, I mean, there were such obvious issues with wires in a very damp environment you know, and young kids stay in there. So I'm just wondering, just even your own opinion on that audit that was done, because from my experience, I couldn't believe when I went back to the local authority that they said that the carbons had been seen and had been passed as being safe. I just don't see how anyone could say that it was a safe environment, particularly for kids. But just if you could maybe comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Kenny. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just to, I know it's probably been answered, but it is absolutely shocking that the rate of suicide in traveller men is seven times higher than the mm -hmm. national. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. Like um, it's shocking when you hear that kind of in black and white. So, if you could comment in some way, um, if you get a chance to say, you know, what what can, how can we deal with this issue? I mean, this is it's a national disgrace. Mm -hmm. You know. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Deputy Harty. Um, just to go back to tra traveller health. Um, I mean, the statistics that you have given are absolutely appalling and, and shocking that there's only eight members of a community of 36,000 who are over the age of 85, and 3% of the population are over, uh, only over 65, or 3% over 65, and the rate of suicide. How much do you associate that with the accommodation problems that you, you have? Thank you. If you'd like to refer to those questions, and I have another group after okay. that. Okay. So, in terms of the um, traveller agency, yeah, we think it has to drive. Like, if you think there's 84 percent of travellers unemployed, we've never had had, had a traveller training our employment plan, mm -hmm. and yet when we had 
18%, 14% of the general population unemployed. It was like a major crisis. Mm. Everybody, you know, uh, galvanised, rightly so, to take action. But the travellers keep falling through the cracks. So that's why we say the agency needs to look at health, culture, accommodation. It can prioritise accommodation its first year of operation. But what, what we're saying is uh, we have fabulous policies in relation to travellers. And what the big gap is, is between the implementation of the policy. So we have the policy, but we do not. There's a gap in implementation, and that's where it's falling asunder. And that's why we thought if we had an agency to drive it, to hold people to account, to share good practice, to, to do those things, we would be hopeful that it may you know, bring about change. In terms of the fire safety, um, there, there was two elements to the initiative, and we welcome that initiative, warmly welcome it, and hope it will now be integrated into the work of the local travel accommodation consultative committees and the development of travel accommodation programmes into the future, because it needs not to just be seen as a crisis thing, it needs to be sustainable and it needs to be. And one of the things we're suggesting is like a core module in terms of the primary healthcare programmes will be on health and fire safety, you know, because the programmes have worked on that for many years. Mm -hmm. So around Christmas and Halloween, they've always had fire safety alerts and stuff like that. Um, we were disappointed because I think I suppose we'd higher expectations and as you rightly say, what they were was visual audits. So someone walked on the site and looked around and you know it was limited. But I suppose what we'd say is it's a starting point but it shouldn't be an end point and that we need a more thorough thing done. But the second part of the initiative was the development of a traveller fire safety awareness training. And that has been more successful. And where it's been particularly successful is when it's been rolled out and run in partnership with traveller organisations. And the fire service have been very open. The problem has often been the local authority. It was getting organised through the local authorities. So there was gaps because the local authority would maybe ring a site in the morning and say, we want you to go down here. Like, totally ridiculous. It was so disrespectful in terms of it, as though no one has anything else to do, you know, that their time isn't important. But also, it was a lost opportunity not to work through the Traveller Community Development Programmes because they would be the mechanism and the primary healthcare programmes. They have the best relationship with travellers. So if you want to be effective, talk to the people affected, you know, and, and give them a voice. In terms of the um, accommodation, um, the, the National Traveller Health Strategy said, and I'll quote from it, there's little doubt that the living conditions of travellers are probably the single greatest influence on health status. Stress, infectious disease, including respiratory disease and accidents, are all closely related to the traveller living environment. It is clear that an immediate improvement in the living conditions of travellers is a prerequisite to the general improvement of health status. So that was the National Traveller Health Strategy. And the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study, which was published in 2010, undertaken by the Department of Health here and in Northern Ireland and done by University College Dublin, said, what we can say is that the better accommodated the traveller family, the better the health status. So there's a clear link between your accommodation situation and your health situation. And that's why we're so disappointed at the inaction since the publication of the All-Ireland Health Study. We, we think it was a, a missed opportunity to, to build on the momentum. And in terms of the suicide, suicide actually accounts for 11% of all traveller deaths. It's huge. Um, and again, we're disappointed. You know, the, the, this, the National Suicide Strategy Connecting for Life was published, and uh, we would have made a submission to that highlighting things. I think we could end up with one sentence, and it had travellers and other vulnerable groups. And that's very disappointing when, in fact, the, and then they talk about evidence-based policy making, and yet the evidence we have is 11% of traveller deaths. So we would have felt it should have been given greater priority and targeting. Each uh, county now has to develop a local implementation plan. And one of the things we're calling for is that travellers should be represented on those given the suicide uh, you know, profile. Um, and we're also looking for an ethnic identifier so that we know what the outcomes are and where the issues are. So, you know, um, say from the All-Ireland Health Study, we, we know that there's an excess number of traveller deaths compared to the general population. So um, 
Travellers, cancer doesn't attack a traveller in a different way than a respiratory disease or heart disease than anybody else. But what we know is that there's discrimination, in A, in getting access to the service, and B, in the quality of services travellers receive. That's documented independently in the All-Ireland Health Study. There's 134 excess deaths every year. If you compare travellers to the general population, there should be 54 deaths. There's 188. So why? It's institutional discrimination and racism. That's the reality. It's people forced to live in really bad conditions. We also know it's, it's very bad for your health to be born poor or to become poor. That's all documented. And what we see is a community that's most marginalised, who has, you know, so you're seeing it in their, in their health, in their, in their life expectancy and in their mortality rates. Um, I think, yeah, I think. Okay. We have another series of questions for you, so we'll be back to you. Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for the, the presentation. And I suppose for those of us that represent constituencies that have uh, significant traveller communities, we spend a lot of time working on exactly the issues that, that you've outlined, so we're, we're well aware of them, but it's very important to have them on the record here. A couple of things. The first is, I suppose, just to express support for the idea of the traveller agency, specifically in relation to uh, ensuring that local authorities uh, meet their statutory obligations. I suppose the one thing I would say is there are some local authorities that do have a better record than others. And I think if we were to have such an agency or if this committee were to recommend such a thing, I think it would be important to have a kind of a, a carrot and stick approach to basically say that look, local authorities have this function. In the ideal situation, they should get on with that job. But where they don't, and where they don't meet those functions within very specific timelines, this agency would have the authority to step in. Uh, uh, and through the emergency powers that are already on the statute book that, for example, the minister used for the rapid bills in Poppentry uh, for planning and for procurement, uh, the, the agency and the managers could go over the heads of, of the local authority and the councillors where they don't meet their obligations. And I think if you did it in that focused way, I think most local authorities would probably start moving much more quickly on fulfilling their own obligations. Um, so I just, I think that is an, an, an argument that is almost beyond uh, uh, making at this stage. A couple of questions, the 40 million, um, given the level of need that's out there and this, the, the poor condition of many of the traveller specific sites of a range of, of types, would 40 million, if the budget was returned to 40 million, even phased in over a short period of time, would that be enough? Um, so I know it's your minimum requirement, but I'd like some thoughts on that. Um, I'm also conscious that, and again, I say this because I work with a, a lot of travellers in the community in Dublin Midwest, there is a section of the travelling community that does by choice want to live in private rental or council accommodation. So you're absolutely right. There are, there are people who are left with no choice, but there are those who want to make that choice. Uh, and I'm acutely aware that that group of people are having particular difficulties in the context of the rental crisis at the minute. So they're experiencing the rental crisis like everybody else, but the additional barriers then to seeking alternative accommodation uh, are even higher. So again, I'd just like your, your thoughts on that, and if you have any specific recommendations you think uh, we could look at in, in the committee. The last thing is, unless I'm wrong, in the programme for government there's about 61, 62 recommendations on housing. None of those relate to travellers or traveller accommodation. And I'd just like for you to put on record your, your, your thoughts on that, um, because while there are, there, are, there are clearly broader issues in terms of health, etc., our function here is to make a report in a short period of time to the Dáil and to the Minister specifically on housing issues to try and find ways of alleviating the most immediate housing needs of all sections of society, including travellers. So if you could comment on that, that would be great too. Thank you. Deputy Butler. Uh, thanks, Cahir Luck. Um, like my other colleagues, I would also like to thank you for coming in here today. I actually feel it's been one of the most powerful, honest, raw submissions that we have received. And I think it has certainly um, laid a marker out for everyone here. Um, you know, um, a couple of questions in relation to the tragic circumstances last year when 10 members of the of the traveller community, and I think there was two babies lost their lives last October. I'm just wondering, has there been any immediate improvement um, for, for the travelling community? You know, I, I think there was such an outrage across the country, and I'm just wondering, did that outrage die off within a couple of weeks again, and you were left to mourn your loved ones that you lost? I'm just wondering, was there an immediate reaction or an immediate response? Um, the second question I, I want to say, it seems to me that um, I'm a new deputy myself from Waterford. The political will doesn't seem to be there. 
I, I think that's that's quite obvious, and I, I, I'm not I'm not hinting at any one party or across the board. The political will doesn't seem to be there, and I think that's something that will seriously have to change. And the third. Uh, point or question is, you know, we all watch on television some of the programmes in relation to the travelling community, my big fat gypsy wedding and different things. And I feel after listening to you today, they certainly don't portray what uh, traveller life is like in Ireland and in England for that matter. There's a perception there that a lot of travellers are very wealthy. They focus on the big weddings, the big christenings, the outfits. And I think that is not doing the travelling community in Ireland any favours at all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think that concludes uh, the questions. And just one final question for myself in relation to this. Um, it's in relation to, as you very kindly made recommendations, really, which was what this committee is looking for. You talked specifically about the establishment of the statutory traveller agency. And you go on to say, with Paris to approve and enforce the local authority five year traveller accommodation plans. And really, what I want to know, and I suppose it has been alluded to, is the sum of those five year traveller accommodation plans nationally, they're done by local authorities and whatever. Does that meet the real need, or do you, do you contest them? So, what I'm getting at, I, I suppose, is is there a step before this required? In other words, do we need a national audit, if you want to be as crude as that, rather than just the sum of individual local authorities. Because if you try and enforce a plan that's flawed to start with, you're not going to get to where you, you want. So you might address the, the range of questions. Thank you. Well, I suppose, just in relation to the, the fat chips you went, it certainly didn't us, do us any favours either, given that we've young girls coming up and probably wanting to get married that I want to go out and spin and get dresses. But I remember I was called for an interview last year and I was asked to do an interview on the radio about first communions and uh, confirmations, the season was coming up. So I got on the phone and I gave a kind of a pre-interview just before and uh, the interview turned around and I was talking about discrimination that we did when it comes to a celebration, that we couldn't get a function room, all these problems. Extended family was very good for us in organising communions or confirmations, that we had a very good extended support we were getting. And I kept going on and she said, look, she says, you're very good at other things, but that's not what we want. She wanted me to turn around and say that we spend five and six thousand pounds on such a thing. We get such a thing. The reality is that a lot of travellers out there who don't spend that, who can't afford to spend it, who doesn't have it. And we did have one of the ministers coming out in recent budgets coming out and all the supplementary events. Fair, all has been cut, the confirmation grants, communion.